Oi. Mike Green, I'm here for Real Vision in Los Angeles, and I'm sitting down with Chris Balding, who most people that watch Real Vision probably have heard something about you either on Twitter or in the news, but you and I came into contact over Twitter, and your background is as a uh, economics professor who was based in China and started talking very openly about it. Right. First, how did you end up in China? <laughs> The first time I ended up in China was uh, one of the greatest stories. My wife had a job here in L.A. doing homes for rock stars, and she had a very bad job she wanted to get out of. And so I actually pretended to be her sending out her resume, and she got a, head, a U.S.-based headhunter that offered her a job on Wednesday, and she had to be in Beijing to start Monday morning. Um, and so, uh, I still remember the conversation telling her, um, honey, I might've found you a job. It's in Beijing. And that conversation did not go super well the first time. <laughs> um, but we ended up going to China for nine years and had a great time. And so when you went over, initially you went over as a bit of a China file, right? I mean, Actually, no. I actually oh. went over really knowing even then after a couple of months in China, um, knowing very, very little about uh, China. And as a, as a junior professor, I was focused on doing the very standard turnout journal articles and academic books and things like that. And that's really what I did for the first uh, probably almost five years of my career there at, at PKU. So what started the change at Peking University? What, what led you to start speaking out and writing about some of the concerns that you had in terms of whether it was China accounting issues or whether it was China's behavior on a national account basis, what, what was the trigger? So the first couple of years, I would say really three to five years that I was there, I really felt like I knew so little that I was just really learning and asking questions and everything like that. And I remember, and I, I don't mean to pick on this guy, but I remember uh, Joe Biden coming to China and writing an article in uh, the Washington Post or New York Times about how China was the future and the U.S. needed to emulate them. And at that point, having lived there for, I forget the exact timeline, four to five years, I was like, well, you know, this is what's being written in the U.S. press, and this just isn't, you know, matching what you're seeing on the ground, um, whether it was inflation data or whether it was all the underlying problems that weren't being addressed. And so that was really what the first time I started to, to, to start just blogging. Um, and at that point, I think it was just uh, my mom and a couple of her friends that were uh, reading what I wrote. And your mom obviously liked it. You kept yes. writing. Did you encounter blowback in China immediately or did that build over time? Honestly, uh, w without any hesitation, I can say I never had the school uh, really push back on anything I wrote about China. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, people at my school got phone calls about what I wrote. Um, I can honestly say uh, I never got any, uh, any pushback. Um, the only time that I know of that I got pushback about things that I wrote about China um, was really involving uh, China only tangentially, and that was when there was a case where there was a gentleman in Singapore that hung himself, um, and he and there was some question as to whether or not uh, it was potentially Chinese military that might have been involved in his, his death. We still don't really know to this day. Um, and he had uh, accused, uh, he had told friends that he was being pressured to work for Chinese military in high-grade mi microelectronics uh, work. And uh, I had written about Singapore, and I knew some of the cast of characters that he was involved with, and they were Chinese military industrial companies uh, that uh, for, are – their armor, their weaponry is really involved in really almost any hotspot in the world. And so I mentioned them in passing about with this Singaporean death. Other than that, honestly, nothing I wrote in China did I, did I get any real official or unofficial request to take anything down. And when you ultimately decided to leave China, so you worked at Peking University until late 2017, early 2018, and then you came back here briefly. What what was the decision process in terms of the dis the decision to leave Peking University? The decision went like this. I was uh, in this late summer of 2017. I had started a petition um, about Cambridge University Press censoring some of their articles on China, and I had created a petition for foreign universities and academics um, to re just reevaluate their relationship with uh, with China. Um, I was scheduled to start teaching in November 2017, and the way it worked at our school was they would open up the registration system for students to register for classes about a week to 10 days beforehand. 
And so I had been in touch with the school in the spring, summer, and early fall um, about my class. And I started, uh, when they opened up the registration system, I started getting emails from students. I was going to take your class, Professor Balding, but it's not listed. I emailed the school um, and they said, oh, well, well, we'll check into that. And mind you, this was roughly a week to two weeks after she wa- uh, Chairman Xi was reelected for life. And uh, the next day after emailing the school, the school informed me that I was no longer teaching in all of 2017-18 and my contract would not be renewed at the end of the year. Um, I suspect, I don't know, that that was, uh, for lack of a better term, a decision that was taken um, outside of the school to, to terminate my contract. Um, the school and I had had, like any normal working relationship, there had been issues over the years. I don't think there was anything there that had been outside, you know, significantly outside of ordinary um, or anything that was unresolvable. Well, and to the extent that you and I have talked over the years about some of these dynamics, I mean, one of the sources for a lot of your information and a lot of the questions that you delved into um, were your students. I mean, you had, it sounded like you had a very good relationship with most of your students and were well-respected, certainly as a teacher. When I looked up your reviews at Peking University, I'm joking, I didn't do that, but, um, but it did feel like this was a fairly sudden acceleration in terms of your relationship with China more broadly. Yeah. And I, th- I think one of the things that, you know, even for me, I think it was very informative. Um, you really began to feel China change in 2012. You know, when I first arrived in 2006 and 2009, um, in relative terms, China seems, you know, looking back now, almost open in, in, in freewheeling. Um, and things really began to change in 2012 when she was there. And I think those changes really began to accelerate in, let's say, 2014, 15. Um, and I remember just some of the incidents. You know, I had uh, a journalist call me up sometime. I want to say it was 2016 or so saying, hey, I need a, I need a pro-China commentary on this specific issue. Um, so this was something that, you know, would have been you know, pro-party, pro-Beijing. This wasn't, you know, looking for an activist position. And I called up a couple of colleagues saying, hey, there's this journalist, would you mind doing this? And the couple of colleagues that I called up said, no, I'm not going to comment. You can't comment in China today. Don't ask me again. And it was very interesting to me that there was such even, and this was a couple of years, this was probably two years before I left, the, of how much the environment in China had changed that people didn't even want to say pro-party things publicly. Well, and one of the things that you and I have discussed, you know, somewhat ad nauseum is the dynamic that began to emerge with Xi's, you know, ascension, I would phrase it as. Um, in particular, he, there seems to be an obsession with the decline of the Soviet Union and and the advent of perestroika and the opening up that occurred in the Soviet Union prior to its dissolution, roughly 1990, right? From what I understand and from what we've talked about, like that seems to be a very key focus in terms of the CCP and in particular Xi. Is that consistent with how you think about it? Absolutely. I I think that is probably one of the biggest things that is missed in in everything that's being discussed about China is she is almost, in my estimation, singularly focused on not just the collapse of China, but the accompanying numerology that is there right now. Um, And one of the one of the ones is is and, and I might be wrong on the name of the plan, but I believe it was the Soviet Union was on its thirteenth five year plan, and China is in uh, the middle or near the end of its thirteenth uh, five year plan right now, and the Soviet Union did not see a fourteenth, and she is singularly focused on not just having a 14th, uh, but on making sure that he does not replicate what he sees as the errors of the Soviet Union that led to its demise, specifically uh, opening um, and liberalization. And that's consistent with the discussion we've also had, which is, you know, my contention is that this is also very true, that she is very focused on this dynamic of 13th to 14th plan. Um, the mistakes of 1989. And the way I look at it is that if you were working assiduously to avoid the mistakes of 1989, you're almost guaranteed to re- repeat the mistakes of 1936-37, right? Which was when Stalin was made emperor for life or appointed for life as both head of the party and head of uh, the Politburo. 
Um, and, you know, the equivalent cultural reformation that accompanied the, the uh, time period in which the Soviet Union withdrew from the West in 36, 37, ultimately culminating in the Ribbentrop. Do you see it similarly or do you, do you think there's a different dynamic at work here? No, I, I think that's, I think it, you're seeing a very similar dynamic play out. Um, one of the things is, you know, the people I continue to talk to in China is you hear things um, about how much sentiment there is to retake Taiwan. Um, you hear about, you know, well, Hong Kong should be grateful to China. Um, you hear all of these types of things. Well, you know, we're just uh, we're just uh, turning Xinjiang into into China. Um, we we have to do this. There's this there's this cultural imperative to make China great again, for for lack of a better term. Um, so I think there's a very similar dynamic, and I I don't think when we talk about you know, the U.S. or other countries working with China, I think there's a very static understanding of how China views itself domestically and how China views itself in um, reasserting itself and taking its place as um, an equal or looking down upon uh, the United States. And part of that is, is this like almost cultural cleansing that they seem to be going through right now to elevate China again. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I see these dynamics playing out very, very similarly. Um, and one of the one of the alternate takes, right? So there's kind of, I would argue, two primary narratives, three. One is China is the future, right? This is the Joe Biden articulation, which is difficult to square with many of the facts on the ground, but certainly remains, I would argue, kind of the consensus view. Um, the second one is that no, China is not the future, but it's going to manage it similarly to Japan, right? That it's going to have a step down in growth, that it's going to age and therefore have deflationary pressures um, and probably an appreciation of the yuan as they seek uh, financial power and, and global power in, in terms of the financial sphere as compared to uh, the manufacturing or, or outright growth. And then the third one is kind of the China collapse model. Right. Um, what do you think about that middle one, the idea that China can gracefully go the route of Japan? So I was talking to someone a couple of years ago um, in Beijing, and I, and, I, and I was talking about the debt pressures that China was facing. And I was unconvinced that Beijing even understood the severity of the debt problems. And I asked this person, I said, do you think they understand the severity? And they said, absolutely, they understand the severity but you're looking at it as if there's a problem there to be reformed. And I was like, what do you mean? They, 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 of course they have to reform it. And they said, no, no, their goal is to just become Japan, not Thailand. So I think internally in the bureaucrats' minds, Debt is not a problem as long as they can essentially always stay one step ahead of a plate that might fall off, okay? Um, however, that is becoming, even the Japan model, um, more and more difficult. And not to say that they're going to become Thailand, but the greater the debt pressures become, both on domestic debt and on foreign debt, you have to elevate it one step above Japan if you're going to make sure that you don't become Thailand. And what that requires is almost going the DPRK model of financial repression. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more that is what you are seeing is that level of uh, financial repression. Um, you know, just as an example, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of evidence that there are essentially price mandates on real estate prices. Um, just this week, we're seeing, uh, just over the past couple of weeks, we're seeing um, evidence of financial repression with regards to uh, pork sales and subsidies, and you need identity cards to purchase pork. Um, so I think what you're seeing is, is for they're realizing that it's going to be more and more difficult for them to even become Japan. And if they do that to make sure they don't become Thailand, they have to become more financially and socially oppressive at every step of the escalation. Well, it's also interesting because I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding of what Japan is, right? So, you know, Japan became rich flirted with the idea of, do we want to become a global superpower? Right? Do we want to challenge the United States? I think somewhat rationally looked at it and said, no, and therefore chose a path 
that allowed them to benefit from the assets that they had accumulated abroad, somewhat at the cost of domestic production. Right? They, they ceded share but gained income. Right? Um, that seems to have changed under Abe, and so there's, there's debate about whether Japan still looks like Japan under that context. I, I would argue Japan is one of the countries that has the most uh, exposure to China uh, in terms of the value of the Japanese yen that, that seems underappreciated on the street. But that does seem like a really difficult path for a country that is fundamentally quite poor. Right? I mean, China has $3 trillion in reserves, but that's $2,000 per person, right? It's just not that much money, right? So if they're looking at that type of difficulty where they think it's really hard to, to become Japan, do you think they go the DPRK or North Korean route? I think, you know, if you, if you just look at the evidence right now um, of where she is taking them socially and, and financially, um, I think you have to believe that, yes, that is the direction they're, they're going. Um, if you just take one example, I think there's, there's pretty strong evidence um, that over the past, say, year or so, um, they're working very, very hard to lower their import bill. Um, and specifically, one example of this would be, you know, a lot of their, a lot of their, um, expo a, lo a lot of their import bill, it comes from two primary areas, um, imports for processing and imports for natural resources that they use as inputs. Um, and one of the areas where they they seem to be working very hard to lower their import bill is in iron ore. How they're doing that is they're essentially shifting to domestically produced iron ore that is, you know, let's say anywhere from a 10 to 20 percent premium. But at this point, at least they don't have to expend FX reserves. OK. And, you know, I was talking to someone that actually ran the calculations. Well, if China has enough uh, uh, cobalt reserves to turn out batteries, what is the payoff period for them to essentially go all electric with batteries and lower their import bill through lower uh, oil purchases? Um, and I and they said, you know, within five years, it's not crazy to think that that is on their to do list to essentially shift away from um, international transactions in oil because we see that happening right now with iron ore. And if they can essentially say we're going to cut our uh, in, our natural resource import bill significantly, it's not crazy to think that they are essentially going to that model uh, in international trade. We see we see that happening already with uh, in in the social realm of how much they continue to tighten up and control speech on on financial matters. Um, I, I stay abreast of Chinese language IB research, and even a lot of the IB research has has censorship mandates about what they can and can't say. Um, so it's the, that, that mod, that DPRK model is clearly, is clearly something that they're at least trending towards, even if they don't go quite that extreme. So it's interesting because this is the sort of thing that you would expect to see and it, and it can have two outputs, right? So over the course of 18 months, if you decide that you're going to de-emphasize imported iron ore, seaborne primarily, and emphasize domestic production, the immediate reaction from most purchasing manager, managers is, I'm going to buy as much seaborne ferrous with higher iron ore content, the 62% plus stuff, as fast as I possibly can so I get ahead of these purchasing restrictions. And that shows up as a positive impulse into the global iron ore markets. And we saw this. We saw the prices rise, and now they've been falling right? Um, as this import substitution takes hold. The other thing that's interesting about that type of behavior, right, is it ends up increasing pollution, destroying productivity, because you can't run the higher technology uh, steel foundries, right, with lower iron ore content, lower purity domestic sources, right? So they've depleted their higher, highest iron ore content ores, and now they're using lower and lower, right, which, which leads to tremendous amounts of slag buildup, et cetera, in the, in the refinery. They just can't do it. So paradoxically, they're going to end, end up in a less productive weaker position through this choice, but it is a choice for autarky, basically. They want to reduce that import bill. Yes, I, and I, I think that's very. That seems to be the direction that they're that they're very clearly moving. And I think fundamentally the issue is this, the the backup issue is is that they're quite worried about their foreign exchange position um, because even as uh, reserves have essentially stagnated for a couple of years, um, money has continued to grow relatively significantly, um, such that if there's if there's any problem, that is going to put a real dent in their uh, in their FX position, especially with all the foreign denominated 
associated debt they have coming due. Well, and when you say money has been growing, what you're really referring to is the broader credit system, right? Not the actual currency in circulation per se. Yeah, so the currency in circulation has been growing in the low, mid, single digits, and credit has been continuing to grow, let's say, in the 11 to 13 percent yeah, range over that time. seems right. Yeah. Um, when you think about where there's an end game here, right? What what can cause a reckoning in China? The way that I always think about a a reckoning is people always talk about, well, you know, they can keep printing money and this type of stuff. And I think of it less as a credit, as a direct credit type of event. Um, and what I mean by that is um, they can always print more money and they can always close themselves off more. When you talk about, you know, what is going to do that, you're, you're, you're typically looking for, you know, and, I, and I, I hate this term, but some type of black swan event, the types of things that we're, that we're not expecting. So when you think about China, um, the types of scenarios that you would kind of, you know, say, okay, what would be an unexpected type of event? Um, the types of things that I, you would not expect is people say, well, real estate is heavily overvalued. And that, that's an accurate assessment. But generally speaking, the loan to value ratios on those accompanying loans, unless you've bought within the past two to three years, are such that it's not going to cause a banking crisis. It may, any significant fall in real estate, however, may prompt people to take to the streets, but it's not going to cause a banking crisis. People have such faith in real estate that they just expect it to go up by double digits every year, no questions asked. So when I lived in Shenzhen, uh, the apartment I lived in would have sold for probably $2.5 million. Um, it was roughly 1,500 to 1,400 square feet. Um, and the average wage of uh, the person who lived there and worked for the electrical company was the, was the, was the developer, um, was probably capped out at twenty dollars to $30,000 in, in official terms. Um, so you can do the math from there at what is it that roughly yeah, a that's hundred, like 100 times, times income. income. Yeah. Um, and so that is, that is, uh, an, an astounding, that's an, <laughs> that's an absurd, uh, ratio. So one of the things we've seen is, is cities and provinces that have been instituting essentially price floors where they won't let transactions take place if it's beneath, a, if it's beneath a certain price threshold. Um, and that gets to the, really the societal fear, even if there's not a, a significant financial risk for most of the broader economy, is that they don't want prices to fall because that's going to create, for lack of a better term, a real societal risk. Um, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's people that track where riots or conflicts take place in China, and one of the more common reasons that uh, riots or conflicts take place in China is uh, a developer will sell 50 or 75 percent of a development um, and then they'll lower the prices for the remaining, you know, 25 percent of units or something like that. And the people who have already bought come out and riot asking for the same uh, price cut. Um, those are the types of things that, uh, that, that, that keep Chinese technocrats and Chinese politicians up at night is if they ever have to announce uh, uh, broad-based falls in asset prices like real estate. And so when you think about something like that, right, you think about that type of environment in which that's a risk and, and levels are 100 times income, you know, in the United States, to put it in contrast, in an urban environment, you're typically going to see eight to 10 times with much lower levels of home ownership, right? So it tends to reflect a wealthy individual in New York City or Los Angeles being able to afford a home when many people can't and therefore live 50 miles away and commute in. When you talk about a place like Shenzhen and those types of multiples, how are they, you know, what's enabling that? What's allowing that to be serviced at this point? How, how do people actually afford to do this? So what you will typically see is that, um, is that basically families or extended families, et cetera, will basically pool their money to, uh, to purchase an apartment. Um, so, you know, I, I had a student that uh, he and his uh, fiance were pooling their money and then their parents, each parent, parents on each side were pooling their money. So this all went into purchasing an apartment for this, uh, for this new family. And this actually generally matches uh, household wealth data that we see. Because even though in, in China there's this fabled myth that households save 40% of, uh, have a 40% savings rate, um, the, the, the implied rates are actually much lower. So that actually Chinese saving household savings rates, they have household 
liquid financial wealth numbers uh, that are much more in line with, you know, Mexico, Brazil, Russia, which have significantly lower uh, household financial wealth numbers, and have also seen lower rates of return over time. So either China is saving much less or the rates of return that they're seeing on financial assets is much lower. Um, you simply can't reconcile this 40 percent uh, savings rate number with the rates of return that have been that have claimed unless that number, unless those uh, financial assets are being consumed in household savings. Well, and this is one of the things that I think people struggle with and the difference between household accounting and national accounting, right? And so on a household accounting basis, you and I think of our savings as the dollars that we don't spend that we put into the bank or into another investment account. In a national accounting system, it's really a solution set for how much money has been spent on investment, in particular capital investment, but other forms as well, right? And it, by definition, in national accounting terms, savings equals investment, right? And therefore, the Chinese are saving a lot because investment is give or take 40% of GDP. Is that a fair characterization? Would you yes, I, th I think that's a fair characterization, yes. Okay. So if I were to look at the actual cash flow dynamics of an individual Chinese household, what would you guess the actual savings rate is? I think uh, if we can take like a little bit of a range, I, I would say that the number is probably somewhere between about 15 and 25% of income. Um, you know, it, it really, you really can't justify based upon, you know, other implied data that it's any number really above 25%. And it's difficult to argue that it's, uh, let's say in the sing in the high single digits or, or low teens. So to take a range, I'd say 15 to 25%. And so when we stop and we think about, again, the system of national accounting and the way we account for it here in the United States, we don't include in our savings numbers, things like social security or Medicare, right, which is money that is theoretically being taxed and set aside for future consumption, i.e. savings, right? It's invested in the form of government bonds that are purchased by a government entity. And so these are actually very similar levels, right? If I take the U.S. 6% and I add roughly the 15% Social Security and Medicare burden combined between households and corporate sector, they're basically like us. Very, very similar, yes, because one of the things is, is that in China, even though they have a, guarantee, a technical guarantee of medical care, um, th that really provides for very little. So there's a lot of preemptive savings where a lot of that savings is essentially set aside for cancer or other medical care, things like that, um, other uh, transitory shocks, um, you know, being out of work. And so one of the, one of the reasons why those, those uh, household financial asset levels are much more in line with your Mexico's and your Brazil's is because there's a lot of consumption of that, uh, of that preemptive savings for medical care, social security, et cetera, et cetera. When we think about, so there, there's, there's more vulnerability at the household level. And as you're saying, where we have seen incidences of effectively write downs of developments, that's been a cause for demonstrations and an attempt to get the developer to refund the difference or to rescind the price decreases, right? Yes, that's correct. How has the state responded to those types of events? So in most cases, they uh, urge the developers to try and negotiate, and there's typically some, time, some type of um, arrangement where they will everybody gets a 10% discount or something like that. Um, there's also cases where they call in the riot squad and clear it and everybody that, you know, had a contract is forced to buy and they just delay those, you know, sales of those additional units for an, another couple of years when people are already locked in or something like that. Um, however, generally speaking, it just kind of goes on a case by case basis um, as long as the problem goes away. And when we think about um, some of the developments that are currently in play, right, so the African swine fever uh, has resulted in pork shortages. We're seeing this in wholesale price, pig prices beginning to surge in China in advance of the Chinese New Year. And I guess the traditional time for making pork soup, which uh, is, is turning into an issue. Um, how do they, how, how do they think about the capacity of the population to rise up similar to what we've seen in Hong Kong or the increased resistance we're seeing from Taiwan? Are they, is it more we'll come to an accommodation or is it more we're going to bring out the water cannons or the actual cannons? So one of the, and this is, this is just speculation on my part, nothing more, but you know, 
they are very smart in Beijing. And so one of the things that you kind of have to keep in the back of your mind as a possibility is that they know that the economy has been stressed for a couple of years, um, since 2015. They know that there are significant stresses in the economy. And so one of the things that you have to th consider is, is that they have been building up this surveillance capacity. They've been building up this uh, censorship capacity um, for exact preparing for exactly these types of scenarios. Um, so whether it's pork, whether it's real estate development, you know, whether it's making sure that news about Hong Kong is, is sold in the way that Beijing wants it to be sold, you have to consider that they've been preparing for exactly these types of scenarios so that they can keep any types of dissent from getting out of hand. And if it does, they can respond in almost real time to a gathering of people in this part of town, um, a riot in this part of town, complaints about you know uh, the price of pork in this WeChat group, so that they're ready for all those types of scenarios. I, this is a theme that I've expressed as well, right? I mean, the deal since Deng Xiaoping has been, don't protest, don't complain, we'll make you rich. Um, the natural conclusion from that is if you conclude you can no longer make people rich, you need to install the surveillance systems that prevent them from protesting, right? And it feels like that's what much of the development that you're referring to has been focused on. It's a realization that things are going to be less good going forward. Um, and so you need to be prepared with crowd surveillance and instantaneous response. That's... Yes. And so, you know, just, you know, and I think... Even for us, you know, we always living in China, we always knew that we were going to be monitored and, and, and expected that. And, you know, we, we never posted pictures of Tiananmen Square on, on WeChat, for instance. But I think even in the last year we were there, my wife comes home sometime in the spring of, of 2018. And uh, there was this there was this intersection where she would take my son and she'd get on the bus. And my son liked getting on the bus. And she comes home one day and she's like, oh, my gosh, this bus stop, which is not even at a major intersection. Um, she's like, they put up a massive bank of security cameras um, so that it basically just on one corner had, you know, everything on the intersection from 10 different angles um, would be covered. And of course, it had facial recognition and could zoom in on different people. And just even within the past, let's say, two years, the, the level that they have gone to, um, I think by any standards, even by Chinese standards, is, is, is quite surprising. When you think about the local reaction, your wife obviously, as a foreigner, is attuned to this the local reaction from your students, from others that you are in contact with, how, how do they think about this rise in surveillance or is it, it's just something they can't escape? It's, it's something that they can't escape, but I will say, I think there, I think there are people, I think there's a good number of people in China that are, that are worried about this. Um, because I think that they, they've always known that they lived in an authoritarian state, but it also is not lost on anyone that they are just barely ahead of the DPRK in being able to access information. Um, and so I think uh, I, I was talking to someone um, that I would consider in China a, a relative uh, political and financial elite. Um, and this was in the spring of 2018. I was at a conference. Um, and this, this was somebody that is kind of, was kind of in the system. Um, they, they weren't, uh, a, a party member. Um, and I was talking to them and they said, there is, there's a lot of worry about, uh, the direction that, that China is heading. Um, and they went to one of the elite schools in China and they said at, at a recent reunion, um, this dominated the conversation about people being worried and, if you go to an elite school in China, um, you are part of the system to some degree. Um, you may not be a party member. You may not be an elite, you know, civil servant or you know, um, mini vice minister. But you're in the system to some degree. You're vested in the system, and so to hear people talking like that um, definitely gives me some hope that there is. Uh, some valid concern. And I'll give you, give you uh, one more story. About 18 months ago, I forget the exact time frame, um, a senior Chinese tech uh, official made a joke uh, on WeChat that the CEO of, uh, of WeChat could read all of his text messages. And it prompted quite the outpouring of concern all throughout China. It was kind of like a dam released um, all throughout China about people talking about 
being concerned that basically anybody at WeChat can read their messages at any time and the government being able to read what they say. And so this is definitely something that's kind of bubbling under the surface um, of people having this concern about privacy, um, whether it's on WeChat, whether it's out in public. And so I wouldn't call it, let's say, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a hot button issue. It's definitely bubbling beneath the surface that people are very aware of. So it's it's one thing to be bubbling and aware of it. Is there a prospect of it boiling over? Is there a realistic prospect of anything challenging the direction that it seems to be going? I don't think in reality there the, that that is possible yet. Um, and I, I think there we haven't had one of those events within China. Um, that, that we know of. We haven't had one of those events. The way that I would like to, the, the way that I think helps me think about it is there's definitely enough bubbling discontent about Xi and the CCP that you will hear people talk very privately and quietly with phones, you know, stowed very far away. Um, but it's still not anything that people will say, you know, with any degree of uh, public uh, statements. Um, and so the way the, the word that I would use to think about it is there's a there, there's a lot of very fragile support for what's happening in China. So that as long as there isn't a significant downturn, as long as there isn't that event that makes Xi look weak, for lack of a better term, um, there's going to be, continue to be support for Xi and the CCP. If there is, for instance, a 25 percent drop in real estate prices, if there is you know, a significant downturn in the economy, something like that, that could change very rapidly. Um, however, I would not expect that to happen anytime soon. So and a, a historical example that I believe we've talked about um, is the German stock market under the Nazi regime, right? which was viewed as a point of national pride. And um, it was perceived as bad some other administrations might think this as well, if the stock market went down. And so a rule was put in place between 1933, I think it was actually 34 that it was put in place, um, and the end of World War II, in which a transaction could only occur at an all-time high price. So the German stock market only went up in a similar fashion. And what you're describing is something identical, right? Where they're basically saying, the only transaction that can ever happen is one at a higher price. And so we'll see falling transaction numbers, but prices remain elevated and nobody has a cause to believe that their property is worth any less. Does that feel accurate? Does that, is that what you think is happening? Because we are seeing transaction volumes fall fairly sharply, even as prices remain elevated. Yeah, so so there are there you know if, if you take the the example of real estate, um, and I, I haven't looked at this in about six months, but you know there there were cities that were at um, by my calculations one hundred year turnover rates, um, and they were still the prices were still going up. Um, and just to be clear, when you say one hundred year turnover rates, that's a measure of turnover relative to the stock of housing. Right? Yes. So, so, so basically, if you started, if you had a hundred units of housing and you started with unit one, and you know went down the line and then started back at the beginning, yep. it would take a hundred years to psych to before you got back to the first housing unit. Got it. Um, I mean, you know, at at the height, uh, you know, in like two thousand seven, I think that that number was like at six years um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so you had very high turnover rates. A hundred year turnover rates is is just you know absurdly high. The lowest number that I found in China, I think, was at roughly a 30-year turnover rate, which is still quite high. Um, so this gives you an idea that there's just not the transaction volume, even though um, prices continue to go up. And that's one of the things that happens under a command economy, right? Yes. I mean, you know, in a market economy, prices, higher prices signal higher activity, right? They yes. encourage new supply. They encourage people to take their existing properties and sell them. In a command economy, perversely, you end up with a bimodal outcome, right? Where prices are set at an unsustainably high level. Demand is much, much lower, and therefore there's very little clearing between the two. Effectively, activity stops. Yes. Is there anything that could force it 
that could force liquidation? That's part of what they appear to be stopping. Um, yeah. And they, they seem to be trying to address in a couple of ways. So for instance, one of the things is, is that even though the, the Chinese household supposedly saves almost 45% of their income, um, they're now uh, one of the most indebted households um, in the world. Um, they're more indebted than U.S. households. And so it presents a real paradox. How does a household save 45% of their income and simultaneously become one of the most indebted households um, in the world? Uh, that's a real puzzle. So one of those things, you know, it, it's very difficult to believe that both of those things are, are true and accurate. Um, on the flip side, you know, we've seen uh, a real clampdown on transactions that don't meet, uh, you know, city or provincial levels for uh, price, for instance. Um, one of the other things on that command economy is you're, you're now looking at a housing market in China where 25% of apartments sit empty. And the one sector in China that is continuing to grow at double digits is real estate and steel inputs to build those apartments. Um, so it, it seems quite paradoxical that they're continuing to channel credit to a sector of the economy which is at 25% unused and is essentially dead weight at this point because of population they're never going to fill. Well, it, it seems paradoxical until you break it down and say, well, wait a second, the sale of land to developers and the building of those yes. properties is the only way you get credit – and it's also the only way you generate financing for local governments, right? This yeah. is a 19th century variant of the United States where the funding for local municipalities came from the sale of public lands, right? And, and if, you look at, if you look at whether it's households or corporations, virtually all of their uh, security in, in loan documents is related to physical assets, primarily either land or real estate. And so if you have that, even if the value, even if nobody lives there, you can very easily go and get a, a loan on that unused apartment. Um, I, I know uh, a couple people that found themselves in situations where they would go rent an apartment um, and then at some point they would be living in that apartment and there, they would come back and there'd be police tape across the door and they'd go to the landlord and say, oh, well, I have to roll over my loans. And so come to find out what would happen is they would have an apartment free and clear and they would go to a bank and they would get uh, a loan on that apartment. They would take that loan, go purchase a second apartment, either free and clear or maybe at with a 10, 25% loan on that apartment. They would then go to a separate bank and get a loan on that apartment. They would, you know, until they had 10. Effectively laddering their position. Yes, so. until they had 10 apartments on, you know, essentially one, one underlying asset. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so that is essentially what you frequently see because people are very, very. Uh, financial institutions in China, very happy to lend out on a specified physical asset. And ultimately, that's there's another variant of this, which is multiple rehypothecation, right? And yes. so we tend to think of China as this extraordinarily organized and disciplined uh, bureaucracy. But as I understand it, there's no uniform commercial code. There's no centralized database of who owns owes money to whom, um, that assets are multiply encumbered, is this is stuff we've talked about in the past? Do you think that still continues to hold? I've heard multiple stories, so it's very, very difficult to pin down what's what what exactly is happening with regards to purely financial credit. Um, and what I mean by that is, if this is one reason why people use different banks, um, and I can tell you, you know, there's even been court cases in 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 China where there's been actual recognized financial bank fraud uh, as a source of conflict. Um, and for instance, there was a case in in Shenzhen um, where uh, there was going to be uh, there was going to be a purchase of a real estate asset. It uh, the, the price that was listed to the bank was different than the actual transaction price and there was going to be a kickback. There becomes this dispute and it goes to the courts. And even though the courts recognized that there was actual bank fraud that took place, that nobody was actually prosecuted for the actual bank fraud um, because there's there's such paucity of, of, of documentation for the uh, for between the bank and the listing uh, that gets recorded at the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so these are the types of problems that, you know, that's why you go into title and you sign all these different documentation, you sign the loan documents, you sign the title documents, et cetera. So everybody, there's transparency in that, in that transaction. And it doesn't happen that way in China. Well, that's one of the things that I think people tend to forget, right? This is that the systems that have grown up around credit accommodation in the Western regime or the developed market regime, things like title insurance, yes. right? 
those don't, by and large, don't exist in China. I mean, it feels very much, if I'm digging into my financial history or economic history, like a 19th century variant of the United States, where wildcat banks have no method of communicating with other banks in terms of a property that they've lent money out against. And as a result, credit claims multiply relative to the underlying assets, which, again, in a system of national accounting, until everyone writes it off, shows up as positive savings. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I can tell I, I can tell you a, a story of a bank uh, that they were in third position. Um, they were on third position in a company that they felt uh, quite strongly was going to go under. And so, if they, being in third position, they were behind very, two very large banks, they were going to face significant problems recovering any assets, and they were going to have to wipe it out. So they actually went to their client and said, "Let's put together a deal where we can essentially buy out the two banks ahead of us. We can." spin this off into a private equity type of uh, entity where it also goes off of our books. And so they actually got one of the uh, two banks ahead of them um, to essentially participate in this, quote, private equity offering. And so both banks ended up with the loan being officially taken off of their books where their client participated in the private equity offering. So, so they listed it as a financial asset and the loans went off of their books. And so technically it's no longer in the financial system. Um, and so both of these banks come out looking cleaner. And so the purpose of that is, is that the banks now uh, are able to boost their overall balance sheet, um, even though they essentially are still backing these uh, these products and loans. So this is a move, which, what you're describing here is just a contingent liability, right? Yes, so this absolutely. is the exact same underlying dynamic of structured products in the United States where a large portion of it was sold off a fraction of the asset was retained, yes. right? But there was a contingent liability associated with fraud or anything else, right? Yes. It's, just, it's the same underlying dynamic. It's, I think to quote Disney, it's a tale as old as time, right? Yes. Um, when you think, it, when you face challenges speaking, either to Western investors or to global investors who might have a different view of China, don't see it with some of the you know, see it with the more rose-colored view of China is the future. It represents a pool of 1.4 billion possible consumers. What's the reaction to your message? <laughs> the people that have been there for any significant amount of time, they know all these stories. You know, they, they, you know, I, I've never met anyone that hasn't been there for you know a few years and and doesn't know all of these stories. I think in in the West, you come to the United States, you come to Europe, and people have some idea that some of this is happening, but then you 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 relay some of these stories and their their eyes just you know get wide like this. I, I, I have this friend in China and he you know he had this great line. He's like, the problem with China is you tell people stories here and they're so wild and crazy that they don't believe you. People just don't believe you at first until, you know, you've come over and you've experienced some of what happens in China and you're like, wow, these, you know, these things are actually, are actually true. Um, but I think especially for financial investors, this is why, you know, the largest flows that you're seeing right now um, are, the, are the passive mandate money. Um, because the active investors, I, I think, are a lot more, generally speaking, reticent now, having seen some of the problems. There, there's a lot less activity in the, in the active mandates um, to, to really dive in because there's so much concern about the unknown unknowns. Well, we're definitely seeing this on the corporate side, right? So, you know, foreign direct investment into China in terms of primary has collapsed, right? We are definitely seeing dynamics associated with things like MSCI rebalancings that is pulling institutional money in, right? So they're, they're looking to match an MSCI all country X US, you know, passive benchmark, which requires them to put money into fixed income. It requires them to put money into equity. And this is purely mechanical. It's contained in the 401ks of Americans. It's contained in the pension plans of, and endowments of America um, and the rest of the world for that matter. Um, with no real analysis of the underlying other than it's big, it's a market, and therefore we should have some exposure to it. Feels like that's the only source of capital that's going in at this point. Yes. I, and, and I think what it, what is so amazing to me is, you know, especially on like the fixed income side, um, there's so little understanding of China um, that – 
people aren't even looking up the IPO prospectuses and going through them and looking at the the bond offering documents. You know, some of the things you've heard international investors take up with regards to provincial bond offerings and things like that are just are, are just astounding to me. You know, knowing where some of these places are and hearing, uh, you know, some of the things that they're going to be doing with this money. Um, and, and to this day, I'm, I'm ne I, it never ceases to astound me that you know you have people putting in this sum of money into some of these places they could they couldn't even find on a map. They're doing it for a very simple reason, right? They don't know they're doing it, right? <laughs> um, so what I'm seeing is the marginal investor is somebody in a target date fund that has exposure to a Vanguard yeah. uh, or BlackRock or you know capital uh, um, that are just plowing money into yeah. an international bond index or into an international equity index with no real knowledge. Right? No real it knowledge. It just comes out of, their for, out of their paycheck. Yes. Um, and and I ultimately, you know, the fiduciary responsibility is offset by, well, we're just market cap weighting everything, right? As long as somebody else presumes somebody else is doing the work and setting the price, it seems rational until you realize the scale of these flows that are unmanaged. Um, Let's wrap up and talk very quickly about what you think is going to happen with the trade negotiations. My expectation is is I would be very surprised if there was uh, any type of deal before tw before the election. And is that driven from the U.S. and the intransigence of Donald Trump, or is that driven by China, in your view? My primary complaint about a lot of the analysis that looks at the trade war um, – that starts in the United States is not that we shouldn't look at Donald Trump and you know all that comes with that, um, but I think there's too many people that are not looking at okay who is my counterparty if I'm if I'm in a negotiation there's there's two there's two people or two sides in a negotiation so I need to look at okay who is my counterparty and I think there's a there's a lot of people that are not looking at what is the Chinese side um, and let's just look briefly at the Chinese side um, I think it's pretty clear. Um, on for many reasons that China is really not going to make any changes to their economic model of, of, of any materiality or significance. Um, and if we look at just how they've re-centralized the economy really over the past, let's say, five years, you know, three to five years, um, that's the entire focus. I also think fundamentally, um, Chairman Xi can't uh, make any significance, you know, and let's let's ignore the political side. It would be it would be politically fraught for him to make any significant concessions, but economically and financially, um, the Chinese economy is such right now that any significant uh, changes to that model um, would, could create very significant financial risks, and I think they know that. Um, whether it's the banks, whether it's the heavy industry uh, that they're subsidizing, that they're that they're keeping afloat, um, these other aspects. I think there's an enormous financial risk to Beijing to making any uh, significant uh, financial changes. So I don't think you can expect uh, Beijing to make any financial uh, economic concessions. And so if we you know, zoom back out now and look at, well, how does that change how Trump uh, is going to be negotiating? If you're going into negotiation and you can look at the other side and say, I don't expect them to make any uh, concessions really, or any changes to what, uh, that I would be asking, you know, and, and the other thing is just politically Beijing has said, you know, look, we're, we're great again. You know, you, you're going to have to deal with that. Um, and so that puts the Trump administration in no matter really what they ask is it's probably going to be no. Um, and everyone talks about how Trump is going to cave or he wants agricultural purchases. I, I'm not even sure at this point um, China is willing to make those, you know, very low-level basic concessions. Um, because if it was, you know, it, it would seem that they've uh, maybe they've agreed to it, maybe they haven't, but they certainly haven't, you know, followed through on those pledges that they're going to to do that. Um, so regardless of what we have with the Trump administration, I think it's pretty clear that China is unwilling to make any uh, changes to their economic model of any of any significance. I lean towards there's probably a, uh, a component of detente, and if there's going to be, it's going to be in the agricultural purchases area, right? So there's, I think China signaled something with the tariffs in particular on pork at this point in time. Um, it's the equivalent of Br'er Rabbit saying, you know, please don't throw me into the, you know, into the into the briar patch. Um, you know, we're going to prevent you from importing uh, pork to China. 
when the majority of people are looking at it like, well, wait, African swine fever is destroying the uh, Chinese pork herd, the swine herd. Um, and so they, they should be doing the exact opposite, right? It's, it feels to me that it's a very transparent move to say, this is something that's really important to us per, to protect and we're willing to take that much pain. When the reality is, is that the imports that are coming in are from companies like Smithfield, which is a Chinese company anyway. Right, so they can very easily refund the tariff back to the corporate entity if they if they choose to do so. Um, it, yeah, it's this is going to be a, a fascinating time. I agree with you. The underexplored part, and I think it's in part because people are so the media in particular is so negative Trump that they're very focused on the CPI impact. Right, who bears the cost of the U.S. tariffs, and they're spending very little time thinking about the implications of these tariffs in the context of can China even accommodate any form of tariff, right? Um, feels to me like China is very close to, you know, the technical term is broke. Um, and any meaningful change would just accelerate that process. And so the easy answer is, let's say no and push it off on the United States and, and say I, they're the bad guys. And I, I think there's two broader themes here which seem to be happening. The Trump administration seems to be saying, I'm going to get, material significant change from China. And if, if I don't get that, I'm willing to essentially decouple and essentially move that manufacturing to other parts of the world. And in fact, what you've seen is that U.S. imports from the world are essentially growing pretty much on trends, a little bit lower this year than the boom year we had last year, where there was maybe some front running of, of imports. Um, but they're growing pretty much on trend. And so what this seems to indicate is that those imports that would be coming from China are slowly being dispersed to other parts of the world. And so that seems to be one of the gambits that Trump is making is, if I can't get significant change, I'm at least going to cause the pain so that it has to go to other parts of the world. China, on the other hand, what I think what we're seeing, which I think is an, an enormously underreported area, is that people say global trade is slowing down because of the trade war. No, no, that's, that's really not what's happening. You're seeing imports into China across the board, regardless, almost a product, regardless of geography, imports into China are falling you know, quite significantly. And what they seem to be doing is, is exactly what we talked about earlier. They seem to be saying we need to, uh, first of all, lower our import bill in total. And we seem to be essentially becoming more focused on self-determination, whether it's iron ore or whether it's chips. Um, and we're going to do that. And so you're seeing this entire trade slowing all th with all of Chinese trade partners, not just the United States. And that seems to be marking a major shift in not just the trade war, but the global economy, where China in some cases was responsible for 50 or 75% of global growth in trade in some of these areas. And that's essentially been cut off. Yeah, I, I see it very, very similarly. And, and would just highlight that if that was actually happening, paradoxically, it would be seen as a rising manufacturing surplus for China. It could be potentially perceived as China is winning. But the reality is, as that happens, it's just the same description as a contract manufacturer has positive cash flow once their business starts to die off because they no longer buy any inventory. They run off their working capital. They convert that into positive cash. And that seems like a real win. It also goes to this idea that China is going to dump its treasuries, right? So Going back to the 1936-37 model, the Soviet Union held on to its U.S. treasuries and any foreign reserves that it could get very fiercely because they had no prospect of generating them yeah. you know, through efficient trade dynamics. And that was made easier because of the Soviet Union's um, uh, you know, raw commodity exposure. It's much harder for a manufacturing entity like China. So as we look forward to the next year, um, are you going to, um, you're going to be heading back over to Vietnam where you've been, been teaching for a while. Are we going to get you back to the States so we can check on, on this in uh, six months to a year? I'd love to have you back on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you um, in places like Vietnam, they are actually actively cheering on the trade war. Yeah. Um, it's actually putting them at, uh, you know, in some industries, bumping up against uh, capacity constraints. They still have uh, port space, but some uh, some other things are being built out as, as, as fast as possible. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll absolutely be coming back in the next six months to a year. All right, fantastic. Can I get you back on then? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Thank Chris. You, I appreciate it.